And welcome back to the show, everyone. My name is Brian Elam. I will be your host here on this episode of the Be Successful series here on Get Your Entrepreneurship Together. Today, we have a very special guest, Mr. Callum Lang, and I hope I'm getting that last name right. Um, yeah. Did. All right. He gave you the thumbs up. Excellent. <laughs> Love it. All right. So Callum, you, you guys are in for a treat here today. Callum has been there, done that, and probably has the t-shirt to prove it when it comes to the business and the entrepreneurship world. He's done everything from IT to consulting to coaching to mergers and acquisitions, helping companies with that, helping people get onto board seats at the companies that they're with. Like I said, been there, done that, got the t-shirt. So I can't wait to get into this conversation. Callum, thank you so much for coming on today. Oh, a pleasure, Brian. It's, uh, lo looking forward to it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So with my audience being primarily entrepreneurs, obviously, and, and those that are kind of at the middle of their journey, some at the beginning, but mostly in the middle and wanting to progress, I really wanted to stick with the, the whole theme of the, the solo entrepreneur or the small business owner. And, you know, one of the things that you sent me that really stuck out was this idea of how powerful collaboration is. And especially when you juxtapose that against competition. So how is it that that collaboration is so much more powerful than competition? Yeah, so I think, um, I think it's everything, quite, quite frankly. Like I, I, nobody gets any level of success without figuring out how to help other people get successful. I mean, that's, that's kind of a, a fundamental and, and, I think sometimes when, if you come through the corporate background, um, it's much more individualistic. Like you fight against your competitor to get the, the promotion. Um, and so you, you don't really, you don't have that approach of, well, let me collaborate with my competitor and, and we can both get better. So. Um, I think it's harder for people that have come out of a corporate background. Um, I, I mean, I, so the, the first book I wrote uh, called Progressive Partnerships, which is really all about how early stage businesses, well, it, it's written for early stage businesses on how you collaborate to, to get bigger. Um, but ultimately the lessons, I, I still apply the lessons to everything that we do today. Um, and I kind of learned it because I didn't have any resources. Uh, so I was a young, dumb, poor entrepreneur making every mistake in the book. I'm not sure I had the T-shirt. I still definitely got the scars. Um, <laughs> Been there, and, done that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so the, the, there's this kind of idea that it – we. As entrepreneurs, we tend to kind of always focus on what we haven't got. Like, we haven't got enough money, we haven't got the right team, we haven't got enough clients. Um, and yet, we live in an insanely resourceful place. Uh, um, yeah, at, at no time in history has there been more money on the planet, has there been more talented people uh, available on the planet, and more clients anywhere that, that, that you want. And so... Um, on the one hand, that's quite an exciting idea. Uh, on the other hand, that can be quite a frustrating idea if there's never been more of it and you still haven't got any of it. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I, I kind of set about trying to figure out, I, I didn't have the money to hire smart people. I didn't have um, the money to do good marketing to attract good clients. So I had to figure out how to leverage off those other things. And, and basically, whatever you wake up this morning thinking I don't have enough of, somebody else somewhere has woken up with an abundance of that, but has a need for something else. Uh, and so the aim of partnerships and, and collaborating is to figure out how you can help someone else get what they're trying to get um, and then use that to help you get, get what you get. But it's got to start with helping other people first. It, it doesn't work the other way around, unfortunately. Right. Right, because you are the one that is needing something 
whatever that thing is, you're the one that needs that. So it has to start from you. That process has to start from you. The, Absolutely. The process has to start with you, but nobody else gives us, nobody else cares what, <laughs> uh, uh, what you want. Um, and so if you, if you frame it in terms of what you want, you're never going to hear back from the person. Um, you, you have to go the extra mile to figure out how you can help them get what they want and, then you figure out how you make that work for you. Absolutely. Yeah. I was, I was just speaking as a, from a starting point of creating that yeah. outward action, that outward action yeah, being reaching out, like you said, to somebody that is looking for something that maybe either you can provide the, yourself or you have somebody else in your network or in your life that could help them. But it's that, that driver of, I got to find somebody that has what I need Therefore, I have to serve them first. Exactly right. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. And that's why the collaboration is so much more powerful than competition, because as you're collaborating and building your network, you're also building your net worth, your resources, and building that goodwill in the community, which competition just won't do for you. Would you agree? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's exactly right. And going a little bit deeper into that, you also talk about the benefits of these strategic partnerships, these collaborations, right? And yep. I was wondering, how do you guide people in order to find the right strategic partnerships to put in place? Yeah, so I think um, uh, most people... Most people overthink it and get very caught up on, I've got to get the perfect partnership. Um, and so we'll look at um, you know, whatever our business is. So we'll say we'll look at Google as being like the perfect company to partner with or um, David Beckham as the perfect brand ambassador for our product, but we're nobody. And so if we approach Google or we approach David Beckham or, or somebody too far ahead of us, we, we're not even going to get a response. Like it, it's too, too big a difference. And so the methodology that I teach in the book, Progressive Partnerships, is you start doing partners with, you start doing partnerships with anyone you can do a partnership with. Um, so your next door neighbor, you the local cafe down the road, um, and what you're looking to do is to build a base of partners. It doesn't need to be something that works for you. So I'll give you um, a great example from, from a few years back when, when I was first doing this. We wanted, there was a big property development company in Thailand where I was living at the time that was sponsoring everything. They had a big marketing budget. And so I wanted to get some of that marketing budget. At the time, I was building networking groups around special interests. And so what I thought was, okay, I will create a property networking group. So a group of networking professionals come together. This property development company is bound to sponsor that. But I knew if I went and knocked on the door and said, hey, I'm nobody um, and I'm creating this networking event, I've got no credibility, I've got nothing on paper, I've got nothing started, would you sponsor it? I wouldn't have got past the receptionist. Like there, there's not not a hope. But, um, and so what we did was myself and my business partner. We um, the, there were two property magazines in Bangkok at the time. One was really good. One wasn't. So we approached the one that wasn't, and we said, "Hey, look, we love your magazine. Um, we know you must have loads of old back copies. So uh, we're starting a property network." What we would love, if it's okay with you, is to make you a media partner and we'll give some of your back copies out to guests when they arrive as, as part of their goodie bag. Um, now, this is such a ridiculously simple thing for them to say yes to because every magazine has got back copies that they need to get rid of. They don't know what to do with them. Um, they're getting this free media partnership for a, a property network. So they were like, yeah, you can have as many as you like. So we, we kind of went around to pick them up and they're like, tell us more about this property network. I couldn't, like I just made it up. Uh, there's not, nothing to say. Um, but now we had a media partner. So then we went to, we started looking through these old magazines, who was advertising. 
that we went to a local bar. Um, we knew that bar was always empty on a Monday night. So we said, hey, look, we're having a monthly networking event. Uh, we can bring 30 or 40 people a month in for this networking event. We can do it here or we can do it at your uh, rival pub across the road, um, which do you prefer? No, 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 no. You should do it here. You should do it here. Like We'd love to have you. Look, we'll, we'll give you a free house pour for everyone that comes in. So now we've got a media partner. We've got a venue. We haven't spent any money. We haven't done anything yet. We also don't have any guests. Um, so the next deal that we do is we go to a real estate agent and we say, look, we want you to be a gold sponsor, but we don't want you to to take a risk on us because we're unknown and, and we haven't done anything. So we'll give you a year's free gold membership. And then at the end of that year, if you've got value from it, you can sign up for another year. If you haven't, no harm, no foul. Um, but each one of your real estate agents can bring one guest along to this event. And they were like, wow, that's amazing. But um, could we also give away a gift prize to like people on the door, like two nights stay at one of our luxury properties? All right, we can do that. And, <laughs> and then they said, uh, and, and could we use your logo on our advertising so, to say that we're a gold sponsor? And I was like, all right, yeah. shit, we've got to get a logo. Uh, <laughs> so so um, basically we just did that and ba totally giving away stuff that was so easy for them to say yes to. Um, but we just built up this base of uh, partners. And, and if any one of these partners failed to deliver, it didn't really matter because we weren't dependent on them. Um, and then what happened? So six weeks of doing this. And on, in the sixth week, I get a phone call from the big property developer. Uh, and it, this guy, Henry, phones me up and he says, Callum, every single meeting I've been in for the last two weeks, your bloody name keeps coming up about this networking event. Like, why haven't I got an invitation? Like, what, what can you tell me about it? So, oh, Henry, I'm sorry, I'm so busy. The only thing we've got left is the naming rights, but I can send you the contract. If you can get it signed to me, it's yours for the year. Um, and that was a $50,000 uh, annual naming rights contract. He signed it and bang. And and then, like, so we'd, we'd created this. We had the money up front. We had this networking event. We'd never even run the networking event. Um, and then we went and sold the whole thing to some people that a couple, that, an American couple actually that were in Thailand who were just trying to build their reputations within the real estate industry. So they were more than happy to buy the whole thing off us because we'd done all the work. They just needed to show up and host it. Um, and so, yeah, that, that was, it's a great example. Um, and now I do the same thing, but I do it with companies rather than products. So we put together, gather bundles of companies and take them public um but it's slightly bigger toys but the exactly the same principle of you, you just do deals that people can't say no to wow that was a fantastic example so guys if you, if you want to learn how to add value and do strategic partnerships right just re rewind that rewind that in the last couple <laughs> minutes and just just watch it again Callum just dropped a but, but, bunch of gold right yeah there. but if you go to callumlang.com um, and stick your email address in, all of my books are available for, for free. So the first one, Progressive Partnerships, goes into much more detail about how you can do those deals. I love that, man. Thank you so much. Yeah, so guys, the, the link to his website obviously is going to be below in the description. So click on that. Go get go get those. But I can't believe you've given them away for free. That's incredible. It's incredible. Yeah, so my, my theory is that Bezos probably has enough money already. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, there, there's always there's always distributing them yourself, but uh, yeah, I agree. Bezos ain't hurting for cash, that's, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. so, I mean, what gen generally what happens is if I give them away for free, people read them, they get inspired, they do cool stuff, they reach out, they let me know, they want a partner, it, it all kind of comes back to me in the end. So. A hundred percent. That's a very good point. I was actually a guest on someone else's show earlier today, and we were talking about that very same point of, of reciprocity and how I approached it was the idea of being prosperous versus making a profit. Whereas making a profit is just purely a transactional relationship where making someone yeah. prosperous, it works on both sides of that interaction. So yeah, I couldn't agree more. Excellent. 
And you also, you also talk about the importance of mindset when it comes to this entrepreneurial journey. Can you talk a little bit about mindset and resilience? And my specific wondering around this is, is resilience a byproduct of a good mindset or is it something else that's within that person? Um, so look, I don't know whether it's innate or whether it's learned, but I know that if you want to be an entrepreneur, you, you're going to have to deal with it. So <laughs> you're going to have to become resilient. Um, I think I was actually, uh, swapping messages with Cody Sanchez the other day about this topic. And I was saying actually like the, when you go through there's that whole um, Winston Churchill quote, when you go through hell, keep going. But with entrepreneurship, um, I have stuff comes up on a daily basis that 20 years ago would have floored me. Um, it would have been like the worst thing ever, like managing directors just quit or something happened. Um, today, it doesn't even register. It's just part of the journey. And I think what happens is your capacity for dealing with stress and bad issues one once you realize so my, my first business was at the height of the dot-com boom we had a recruitment company selling um ip engineers into telcos in europe and it was incredibly successful and uh i was 23 24 years old making far too much money having lots of fun thought I was incredibly talented and good looking. Um, and then the dot com bubble burst and it turned out I wasn't nearly as talented or good looking as I thought I was. Um, and I was like, oh, my world's ended. Like this whole business is collapsing. Um, and, but what happens is the world doesn't end. Um, you kind of figure your way through it and you, you move on to the, next project and the bigger and the better project and then something goes wrong with that you have the global financial crisis or something else happens and um my my current business partner jeremy harbour has a great analogy he says as an entrepreneur it's like walking a tightrope um but when you fall off you discover the tightrope was only a foot off the ground um like it's not the end of the world uh, you, you can get back on um and i think that that's quite useful i think the other thing that's probably had one of the biggest impacts in my life uh, in, in terms of kind of philosophies that I work with is an idea that environment dictates performance, um, which is something that I learned from Daniel Priestley, who's a close friend and a very, very successful entrepreneur. Um, and really that's the, like up until that point, I'd always tried to sort of motivate myself and I kind of read the Tony Robbins books and like every day I'd be like trying to get myself psyched up and um what Daniel pointed out was we behave our, our behavior is determined by the environment that we're in so in some environments we're very extroverted like well, we're friends and um, whatever in other environments even the biggest extroverts become introverted because they're out of their depth they don't know who to talk to and, and um, so everyone kind of swaps in that environment. If you are sitting at your kitchen table six months into your business, trying to figure out Google ads and how to hire someone, and it's not a great environment um, and things aren't going well and you're just kind of stuck there. It's very easy to kind of get into this downward spiral. You imagine that if you uh, you take that exact same person and you put them into Google or NVIDIA or one of these top companies, how much their performance would suddenly shoot up because the expectation is that your performance is like everyone around you is performing at a high level. Um, today, like one of the, the companies that I've got, one of the faster growing companies that I've got is called Veblen Director Program. And it's really about helping people get their first board seat. Um, and so we teach them how to, to do that. But more importantly, they join a community. And, and when you join that community, you, you get put into an accountability group, but you're also part of a wider community where every single day people are posting, 
hey, I've just been offered a board seat on this company and I've just joined the board of this company and I'm being paid to do this on this company. And when everyone around you is sitting on boards, it becomes really odd to not be sitting on boards. Like you, <laughs> that's the, the, the kind of uh, dynamic. Um, and so I think if you, if you find yourself struggling uh, with mindset at any point, the, the trick is to get yourself into a different environment, put yourself, surround yourself by people that are more successful than you. Um, in, in my most recent book, which is called Border and Blueprint, uh, I talk about a rowing analogy from when I was at university and was president of the rowing club there. And I was the best rower in our club. And uh, I thought that was great being the best rower in our club. And then during the summer, I was invited to go and row in a senior elite team. Uh, and I was the worst rower in that boat um at which was mortifying to me and i was terrified of screwing it up but i learned more i became so much better in the next two months of rowing with this senior team because i didn't have to worry about anyone else on the boat i just could follow them and get better and focus on myself and the the sort of the analogy that i've always used from then is that i always want to be the worst person on the team um because that's the you're under the most pressure to perform um and it forces you up just to to keep up in your game so um yeah that sort of environment dictates performance is a great uh, a great mantra if you're if you're struggling with the mindset at all that's that's awesome i love how i love how you didn't just focus on one particular aspect of mindset like imposter syndrome, for example, and just went right for the thing that'll help you change, which is an environment, getting so, around people so actually, that will level you up. Yeah, I actually talk about imposter syndrome a lot, but I talk about it in a very different way from most people. I talk about it as something you should be striving for. Um, okay, so let's, so let's when you're... gotta talk about that, because that's, I've <laughs> okay. never heard that. <laughs> yeah, so I am, um, this is like when I'm when I'm talking to people, I'm training, coaching people on how to get their first board seat, and then they're all, yeah, this is going to be on out of my depth. I don't know what they're talking about. They're speaking a foreign language, um, and they have a real sense of that imposter syndrome. And that imposter syndrome is driven by the fact that you care, like you genuinely care about wanting to do the right thing and not wanting to screw things up and so if you go and sit in a board meeting and by the way i've sat in hundreds of board meetings where i've gone crikey i'm out of my depth like what are they talking about what what reading was i supposed to have done that i should have under be understanding this conversation um and and because you feel it and because you care you then finish the meeting and you phone somebody up and you say hey look i'm sorry but i was completely out of my depth there what should i be reading what should i be doing and you you go and you get better and the next meeting you feel slightly less of an imposter and and you you move up when i first started joining boards and part of the reason why i started the veblen director program was i realized that there's a lot of people on boards that don't feel imposter syndrome and they really should they just don't care enough um they're on boards it's just about their own self-interest uh and um it, yeah i genuinely think that if you're not feeling imposter syndrome it's because you're not pushing yourself hard enough and you, you need to be if you want to grow you need to get comfortable being uncomfortable and that means putting yourself in awkward situations and and then if you genuinely care you you do the work to make sure you feel a little bit better the next time and, and so on and so on. Yep. That makes perfect sense. Yep. And I, I was just going to, and you mentioned it already, but I was definitely going to say, if you didn't, the whole thing about getting out of your comfort zone and that being the driving factor of helping you move forward with that. And, and just, yeah, you have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. That's it's, I know it sounds cliche, but it's so, so very true. Works. Yeah, a hundred percent. So talking about getting out of your comfort zone, I want to dive into a little bit of the personal side of you and your story. You made what I would consider to be 
a huge move in your life back in, I believe it was 2002, moving from the UK to Asia. That's a big step, my man. What made you do that? Um, yeah, so I kind of got a bit of migrant uh, blood inside me anyway. So I was born in New Zealand. I grew up in the UK. Um, my first kind of grown up job was for an internet company and immediately they offered me a chance to work in Amsterdam. So being like early 20s, being paid too much money living in Amsterdam, it was pretty, uh, yeah, you're not going to turn it down. It was a, it was a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> Lucky you survived. And then, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It probably wasn't very good for my health. But um, uh, so that was good. And, and I ended up setting up my first company there um, and I did a stint in Ireland as well. Um, but I remember looking at the big... So I was trying to figure out sort of entrepreneurial ideas and where I wanted to go. And I was looking at the big sort of demographic shift. And obviously technology was a huge one. Um, and there, there was a few others, but the one that kind of stood out to me was that there was the, at the time, so this is like 2000, uh, there was the largest transfer of wealth in the history of mankind from West to East. So all of this money, like the Asian tigers and everything was going on. China was growing at an insane rate. India was growing at an insane rate. Um, and it just struck me that if you've got a huge amount of wealth going from west to east, as a young entrepreneur, it kind of makes more sense to be on the receiving end of that game than, than the giving end. Um, and so I said to my girlfriend at the time, who is now my wife, um, I said, uh, Look, I want to be in Asia. Um, she was a primary school teacher. Uh, I was young, dumb, and invincible. So I said, look, you get the job first. I'll, I'll make it work, whatever happens. But, um, and I only really, to, to be honest, I only really kind of knew Singapore, Tokyo, and Hong Kong as, as Asia. Um, and she phoned me up and she said, I've been offered an amazing job in Bangkok, in Thailand. So I said, okay, let's go and give it a year. Uh, and we ended up living there for nine years. Uh, and it was, it was incredible, uh, incredible time. But yeah, I literally, I landed in Bangkok. I knew one person, which was her and she didn't know anyone. Um, and so that was the first time that I, that was the first time I really understood the value of network because I didn't have any network. Um, and not only that, the people that I had always had around me that I could just pick up the phone, they were now eight hours behind me. Um, so I couldn't even just pick up the phone and say, hey, what would you do here? Like it was all, um, yeah, it was all quite, quite tricky. But, but it was also quite freeing in a sense that uh, it was kind of like a fresh piece of paper and, okay, you can kind of do whatever. And, and Thailand, fortunately, is, is a very cheap place, not not as much now, but even so, um, at the time it was an incredibly cheap place to live. And so, uh, that meant that you were free as a, as a young budding entrepreneur to kind of make lots of mistakes and, and none of them be too, too fatal. Uh, mm. So I had a chance to kind of get, get through quite a few learning cycles. Uh, um, and then ultimately we moved to start kind of grew up a bit and had kids and as we moved to Singapore, which is a little bit of a more grown up country. Um and, and actually actually easier to do business, but the um not much, much easier to do business, but the the learning that I'd got sort of around the fundamentals of entrepreneurship and not being afraid to make mistakes and stuff, a lot of that happened in Thailand. So yeah, that was that was the move. Hmm. And did you, going back to mindset here in a little bit, did you find that the excitement of that blank piece of paper, like the possibility was, was the driving force that kept you excited and kept you going and pursuing that? Or was it something else? Um, so I think there was an element of, I didn't have a lot of choice. Um, it's so places like Thailand, they're, there weren't a lot of job opportunities for foreigners. Um, it was kind of like I could be an English teacher or on nothing a month. Um, 
or or get out again. So, um, yeah, on in those times when it was really tough, uh, there was sort of a like, well, I don't actually have a lot of options here. I just need to make it work. So uh, I get get back onto it. Um, but I also one one of the things that uh, now I kind of formalize and call an advisory board, and, and I'm a huge believer that every entrepreneur regardless of where you are on the journey not only should you create an advisory board around your company um, but you should be sitting on the boards of other companies like it's a it's a great way to learn um, now at the time i didn't have the language to call it an advisory board but what i did just again sort of element of desperation was i would go and find people that were more successful than me and try and learn like buy them lunch try and get them drunk, find out what the secrets of being a successful entrepreneur were, that, that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, to, today I would call it an advisory board. At, at the time, it was just me um, yeah, trying to bribe my way into learning something from people that were more successful than me. But um, I did find, and, and I think this is still true today, is like if you demonstrate that you're genuinely willing to learn and listen um then people are, are very very open with sharing their journey with you and and what they've learned yep i was uh, listening to a podcast yesterday that touched on that very subject and the guy the host was talking about the scenario of someone new to a gym coming in and seeing this guy who's obviously in incredible shape working out and the newbie comes up to the guy who's just in great shape and is like hey man you are who I want to be. Like, I know nothing about the gym. How do I do this? Can you help me? And that guy will just tail will bush up like a freaking peacock and be like, yes, I would love to take you under my wing and show you my ways, you know, because yeah. it's, we all want to feel seen. We all want to feel valued and important. And if you're able to come with that kind of humility, and just ask for someone's yep. knowledge or guidance that automatically shows that you respect where they are and who they are. And it's just, it makes it an easier choice for them to say yes. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. And talking about Thailand in going through some of your posts and everything, I discovered that you do Muay Thai. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I love that and definitely much respect. I'm a fellow martial artist as well. I do Salam Kung Fu. So right, right. what what got you into Muay Thai? Have you always been into martial arts or, or how did that develop? No, I actually tried it the first few times in Holland, which has quite a very uh, strong kickboxing uh, sort of background. Um, and I just loved it as a workout um and i did a little bit in thailand not not so much um and then actually really got into it uh, a number of years ago in singapore and again just mainly as a there is no better workout um and it doesn't matter it, it doesn't matter how tired you are if somebody punches you in the face, it <laughs> wakes you up. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I kind of took it quite seriously for for a few years. Um, uh, and then, yeah, I kept getting older and slower and the people I was sparring against were getting younger and faster. Um, and uh, I ended up, um, I fractured my shin, which uh, was was quite painful. Um so I kind of gave it. I thought that was sort of my my uh, uh, was a sign that I was probably getting a bit a bit long in the tooth for it. Um, so I gave it up for a few years, but it really annoyed me that I wasn't doing it. And so I have recently uh, started it again and Muay Thai and boxing. So yeah, it's just fun. It's uh, it's a really good way to stay in shape. I do, yeah, I do enjoy it. it. It definitely is. I've taken some kickboxing classes in my past that have been also incorporated some Muay Thai and, and yeah it's uh it's intense you will definitely get your cardio in <laughs> yeah 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 I, I mean I haven't like I've done sort of pretty much everything uh, I, I, I mean I play 
soccer at the weekends and um I've done kind of boot camps and everything else, but not nothing compares to um actually like especially if you're sparring, like just the because I, I, I think it's that it's it's mentally as well you have to be really on the whole time and so and i i find it uh i wrote an article years ago for the next web um around the kind of the three different types of sports that i thought or three types of fitness that i thought entrepreneurs should should be doing and one is kind of doing the long distance stuff so like if i've got something that i really want to try and figure out like going for a run or going for a cycle um and just kind of going over this idea in my mind but i actually more importantly i think you should always do something that breaks the cycle of what's going on in your mind so playing football muay thai or in any competitive sport it's very difficult to worry about paying salaries if you're chasing a ball or like and it's i think it's hugely important to get yourself out of that because otherwise you can get stuck in these loops um where we're just constantly thinking about the same thing um so that was the second one and the third one is doing something like weightlifting or anything where you can track and measure your own progress um because so much of an entrepreneurship is outside of your control there's so much luck involved um and it can be really really frustrating when you kind of feel like okay i've tried a hundred things and one in a hundred is working um and so you can say, wow, the economy is tough and my employees are numb nuts and yeah, clients are grumpy. And, um, but the, the one thing about reducing your body fat or increasing your, the weights you're lifting is that you've got no one to blame, but yourself, it's all on you. So it's, uh, um, you know, that accountability I think is, is quite useful for entrepreneurs as well. Absolutely. And I'm glad that you went there because I was going to ask you about the relationship between being an entrepreneur and physical activity. So it was perfect, man. You're reading my mind. I love it. <laughs> yeah. I, can, I mean, I, even, even when I wasn't doing Muay Thai, I had to do something like it's, um, and it's, it's more about the mental side. <laughs> like I, I've just got to be able to do, do something every day to get away from screens and Oh yeah. hundred percent. It's super important. We're, we're so just locked in to screens from computers to iPads, yeah. to phones, all of it. It's, you, you definitely need that getaway and, and a different way to engage your mind. Because like you said before, it's, it's really hard to think about something else when you're dodging a fist or, or trying not to get kicked in the leg, you know, <laughs> So it forces you outside of that framework and really lets you be yeah. present. And we yeah. don't get a whole lot of that these days. So I'm glad we went into that. Uh, so I want to go back, maybe not to entrepreneurship. Maybe this might be a personal answer. I don't know. Um, but I always ask people when they come on, what is the hill that you're willing to die on? Is there a certain philosophy or a certain thing that, that you think or way you behave that you are like, I am never going to change my mind about this until the day that I die. Is there anything like that for you? Um, it always amuses me on Twitter or X, the amount of hills that people are willing to die on. <laughs> the stuff that, uh, yeah um i don't know i mean I, I kind of um i actually at the moment am going through a process of because because i've got i've got kids that are 11 and 14 um and uh also because i'm coaching people on how to become directors and i'm really so we, we do a whole section on wealth um because obviously and if you play the director game well you can make a lot of money and if you start structuring deals you can make really life-changing money um and yet i realized that a lot of people have a uh, a very weird relationship to money um and actually what happens is a lot of the values and a lot of the hardcore beliefs that we have we form as kids um and they just sort of become hardwired into our conscience and that doesn't make any sense because 
kids are dumb. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, well, um, I used to be one. I, I have no argument for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I love them dearly, but they're they're dumb um, because they haven't learned enough yet. And yet, I can see that they're learning stuff now that will become those those hardcore sort of beliefs. And the example I give for myself is that even well after I had made it and I was successful and I was money wasn't really an issue I could not bring myself to take a drink out of a mini bar in a hotel because when I was a kid that was the thing like my mum was like oh, no, no, never it's like it's too expensive it's too expensive right um and so I would leave a five-star hotel walk around the corner to a mini mart to get a, a drink and bring it back. And I was like, what am I doing? I mean, the, what I charge for my time, that makes no sense <laughs> at all. Uh, um, but it was just like one of the, these hardcore beliefs. So uh, actually, if anything, um, I'm sort of challenging my own hills on stuff and going, it, it, does that really make sense? Or is that something that I uh, believed as a kid and, and have still clung to? So um yeah, pro probably not. Uh, or if there's a belief, uh, a hill that I would die on, it's being willing to change your hill from time to time. Yeah, I like that. And, and that's where my mind went as soon as you mentioned Twitter. And I was like, yeah, some of those hills, I think, are pretty superficial for people or they're res <laughs> yeah. responding to a moment in time, you know. But uh, yeah. Yeah, and I think you're right. I think those, those hills and those viewpoints, they can change. And, and ought to change as we get older and as we develop and you know just to your point about the you know kids being dumb and well they are and a lot of it's because their brain is not you know our brains as humans aren't fully formed until we're about 25 years old and so and that being the case and us being very young like three four Five, all the way up to, they, I think they say seven years old is where like zero to seven are your most impactful and imprintable uh, times. Yep. So you have things happen to you in that time period and you don't know how to process them. You don't know what they mean really. So your yep. brain just makes up a bunch of crap and it's usually wrong. It usually doesn't mean what you think it means, but you've taken it in, you've imprinted it. And it's so tough. Yeah, and it, it, it is kind of, I mean, it's like, it's very understandable, but it's your, typically you end up voting the same as your parents voted. You have the same religious beliefs as your parents. You have the same views around money or entrepreneurship or like a, a lot of these views get formed when, when you're at that very impressionable age, which is perfectly understandable. What's, less understandable is why we don't get to kind of and look some of us do some of us kind of have an epiphany and go okay well actually i don't believe that and and sort of we, we shift but uh, but we might do that on one thing like okay my parents were religious i've decided i, I don't want to be religious uh, i don't believe in that but i still share like the same values and and other pieces so but we, we're just not very good at analyzing i had a mentor once we were talking about spirituality and i remember like i was very i was young like 25 or something and he was talking about spirituality and and how important it is on the journey i was like yeah but you don't really believe that like you don't believe that the universe is really conspiring to help you um and he said well what do you believe and i was like well, I, we're on our own and he goes great if that belief serves you and i was like, what he said if that belief serves you uh and and then we kind of i kept going kind of back into this conversation he just kept repeating this answer if that belief serves you uh, um and it never occurred to me before that you could determine your own beliefs and some beliefs will beliefs will serve you and some beliefs uh will hold you back or constrain your thinking um and yeah i remember walking away from that conversation going oh <laughs> Right, there's a there's a door I need to go through that I hadn't uh, thought thought about before. So, um, yeah, it's an interesting interesting space. It is definitely an interesting space, and there's a whole rabbit hole you could go down with that. Um, 
trying to reconstruct and rebuild your past and get over trauma and all that. But, you know, that we don't have near enough time left for that. So we're just going to keep moving on here. Um, so thinking about, thinking about again, back to you and I want to know what is your personal vision? Like what is, what is Callum doing all of this for all of this entrepreneurship journey and the things in business? Like, what are you doing this for? What do you, what do you see as like your Nirvana moment? If for lack of a better term. Um, so I think uh, I kind of have got to a point where I am able to view it much more as a game, uh, and it's a it's a fun game. And the more I can help people, the more people I can help, the the more fun the game becomes. So, um, look, I, when I was you know, we were taking companies public. We took over a hundred companies public in the last eight or nine years. Uh, because of that, I was seeing that a lot of boards were very dysfunctional and not actually representing stakeholder interests. And so, and there was a lot of very talented people being overlooked for boards because they came from the wrong background, the wrong gender, they didn't look the right way. Um, and I thought, yeah, as an entrepreneur, that frustrates me. So I set that up to solve that problem. Um, and every single day, one of our members gets a new board seat. And that's really cool. And I get more joy and excitement from that than I've ever got from getting my own board seat. So, um, but equally, uh, you know, we've got nearly a couple of hundred people sitting on boards around of very cool companies around the world. Now, that's a useful network to have. And we're adding kind of you know, 10 to 20 a month to that. And so that opens up a bunch of opportunities and then you kind of say well okay what other skills do they need um uh the, you know probably the most valuable skill they need is learning how to raise capital and most people all the conventional wisdom around raising capital is all based on what worked 50 years ago it's like come up with a nice deck go and hit like knock on 100 doors it doesn't work like that that's that sort of silicon valley mantra is just complete nonsense it's not how money gets raised money gets raised through trusted relationships um and so now i've set up another company another business to train people how to build networks of investors so that they can just give trusted deals to trusted networks and and so um yeah i kind of see it more as a as a game and and that the more people I can, you know, if I can help uh, two or 3,000 people get onto boards and I can help a few thousand people learn how to raise capital better, um, that becomes a really useful platform for whatever I might want to do in, in the future. Um, so, yeah, it's more about, and look, as long as I'm hanging out with cool people and learning new stuff, then, then it's fun. Absolutely. I've... I'm not to the point yet where I can totally view it as a game, but that is definitely where I'm headed. That's what I want. And so I'm very glad that you found that for yourself. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, Calum, this has been an amazing interview. This, the, the nuggets that you have dropped are just incredible. So thank you so much for that. And before, before I let you go, I wanted to ask, well, not ask, but kind of put this out there. Like, what do you need? What could serve you and help you or your business get to the next level? And on that vein, what would you like to ask the next successful entrepreneur that I interview? Because if you have a question, I will ask that person. Um, okay. Well, in terms of what I need, uh, it's it was really just to to get onto your podcast, Brian. Because I think like once I reach your audience, that's um, as aspiring entrepreneurs and and uh, entrepreneurs that are growing, those are the people that I want to connect to. Um, so yeah, if if uh, for your listeners, if if they have enjoyed this podcast do reach out to me on linkedin or go and stick your email address into callumlang.com and uh, download my books i hope they're useful for you um in terms of a question for the next entrepreneur um it's a tricky one i haven't given that any thought um i 
podcast questions have all been so done to death now, haven't they? It's like <laughs> <laughs> trying try, trying to come up with something unique or individual. Uh, I'll, I'll ask them what what's the most unique question that you would ask the next entrepreneur. Um, <laughs> 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 Yeah. Uh, well, you do so, play soccer, so you're good at kicking it down the field. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. Exactly. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> All right. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, make sure to hit that like button, subscribe to the channel if you're not already, and make sure you share it out with your friends. You never know whose life that you can touch and help improve by sharing out great content like this. And again, Callum, thank you so much for your time here today, brother. It was an absolute pleasure. Yeah, Brian, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you. Absolutely. All right, guys. Peace. We'll see you in the next one.